that's on. All right, if everyone's ready to start, we'll begin. This is the fire safety segment of CERT training. This is an abbreviated slide because we want to obviously refresh people's memories, not start from scratch. Okay, um, to remind you, combustion is a four element uh, operation. You have to have fuel, you have to have temperature, obviously to increase the combustion of the fuel. You have to have an oxidizing agent, which usually is oxygen, and that's only 20% of what we're, well, 21% of what we're breathing right now. But the last item that most people don't know about is the uninhibited chain reaction. It's a chemical reaction that produces free radicals of oxygen and hydrogen, and that actually continues the combustion. Uh, to remind you, propane gas and butane gas have different properties. So if you're involved in a propane or a butane gas leak, you have to understand they are heavier than air. Therefore, they will flow to the lowest uh, point. And if they encounter an ignition source, will ignite. There are, for us, basically three basic uh, classes of fire. Class A are combustibles, paper, wood, clothing, carpeting, furniture. Class B fire is a combustible or flammable liquid. Combustible liquids are those with a high flash point like motor oil. Flammable liquids are like uh, gasoline, a very low flash point. And the last one we're normally involved with is a C class fire, which is electrical. And we classify it differently because whatever you use to extinguish it has to be non-conductive, otherwise you'll get shocked. And that's why we have C-class extinguishers. We also have D-class, which are combustible metals, sodium, um, uh, magnesium, uh, metals like that, which do combust. And the last item are K for cooking oils. The reason is commercial kitchens all have uh, extinguishing systems mandated by code. And we want to make certain that whatever we use on that material doesn't negate the use of the uh, automatic suppression system. Our primary methods of extinguishing are you can remove the combustibles from the heat. Well, that's pretty obvious. Reduce the temperature of the combustibles. Uh, that's something that, that get, uh, water will do. Reduce the oxygen or other combustion gases. Uh, you inhibit the flame chain reaction. We do have extinguishing means that inhibit the flame chain reaction, actually stop the fire from happening. There are some secondary methods that have gained some popularity with YouTube. One was a video of some college students who used a boom box to extinguish a fire. Uh, that's a very well-known uh, method, vibrations, uh, ion separation, strong force fields. The military is looking into being able to shape a flame using a force field. The only concern is how do you remove the heat? And of course, any of the com any combination of the above will do the same. We can use water. Um, that's obviously an easy one. Dry chemicals, sodium bicarbonate and ammonium phosphate are the two basic ones you would find in uh, B-class extinguishers. If you buy a multi, uh, multi combination extinguisher ABC, it will have monoammonium phosphate. Carbon dioxide, which is a little more difficult to contain. Chemical foam, which is pretty common and the fire department uses it regularly. Uh, and we also have chemical agents. Uh, we used to have uh, halons. We now have halotron and energen. Energen is basically a European development and it's uh, green material because it doesn't affect the ozone layer. So do we need three different types of extinguishers? No. And by the way, that's an A class, which would be water, a B class, which would probably be sodium bicarbonate, and a C class, which would be carbon dioxide. They still do this in Europe, except in buildings that I'm involved in, and we use one extinguisher that does all three. It's um, The reason is, you don't want to have to make a decision as to which extinguisher to use on which fire. 
uh, in this case, you don't have to worry about it. The pressure gauge is, is primary to the extinguisher and it tells you whether or not you have a, a full charge. In this case, this is a 300 PSI nitrogen charged extinguisher. Uh, and it is a multi uh, use ABC extinguisher. If the seal is broken, there's a, a, a copper seal in this part. If it's broken or it leaks, uh, you'll lose pressure. And if you've lost pressure, it needs to either be recharged or replaced. Uh, an undercharged extinguisher may not discharge any material at all. I recommend you buy an extinguisher with a hose and nozzle because all of us can, can aim a hose. We water our garden. Um, that makes it a lot easier to hit the fire. The minimum rating I recommend for home use is a 3A 10B C rated, formerly known as a five pound. We no longer do that for the last 40 years, but um, the rating is the important point that it gives you the amount of material necessary for residential occupancy. Remember that they have a limit in how long they will discharge and in how and what range they will shoot a stream. Uh, most of them, if they're fully charged, can shoot up to 18 feet and can be discharged for 14 seconds. But bear in mind, 14 seconds isn't an awful lot of time if you're trying to fight a fire, which is why certs only fight very limited fires. Small fires about the size of a trash can. Uh, and usually if it's only incipient, now we teach uh, fire extinguisher use for your own home use as well, but we do have uh, cert training for doing it as teams. Now, something to remember after a utility, uh, if you've got a utility fire, the only way to remove it is to shut the gas off, which of course we cannot do. You do not want to extinguish a natural gas fire because the natural gas is still uh, escaping and you'll have an explosion. We as certs don't try to suppress large fires. They, the guys with the red trucks can do that. We don't fight the fire alone. And again, we use the buddy system and we don't enter smoke filled areas because without breathing apparatus, this is the deadly part of the fire, this, this products of combustion. We use the buddy system as shown on the right, uh, not what's shown here. Obviously this buddy is doing his buddy no good at all. If something happens to him, he's 20 feet away. So you want to stay in contact with your buddy uh, anytime you're using an extinguisher as part of CERT. Certs don't get hurt. We use personal protective gear. That would be gloves, goggles, hard hats. The always have two ways to exit. Don't attempt to extinguish a fire if you don't have another method out uh, because what can often happens is it traps you. We size up. This is the same for everything we do in it, whether it's first aid, uh, disaster psychology, we size up whether or not we're in a situation we can suppress a fire. We need to develop a plan of action very quickly, of course. Do my buddy and I have the right equipment? Are there other hazards such as electrical wiring? Is the building structurally damaged, which creates another problem. And of course, we do not enter structurally damaged buildings that have severe damage. Can my buddy and I escape? That's the most important because it can often get out of hand. And can I and my buddy fight the fire safely? The safety of the individual, individual CERT members is always our top priority. How to use an extinguisher? The acronym is PASS. Pull the pin, aim the hose, squeeze the handle because that's what discharges it, and sweep the fire left to right and, and not rapidly, but slowly, because you want to put the most extinguishing medium on the fire that you can. And it's at the base of the flame that you will extinguish the fire. Aim at the base of the fire, not at the top. You can shoot an extinguisher all day into the flames. It'll do no good at all. Sweep from side to side until it's out. And I, rec I emphasize that's a slow sweep. You want to make certain that you put all the extinguishing medium on the base of the fire. Maintenance, if it's 12 years or older or if the gate reads low on pressure, I would just replace it. 
if you're going to purchase one, purchase one with a metal head, not a plastic head, because they will never be recharged. And to be honest, a recharging extinguisher is probably uh, not cost effective. It's better to just buy a new one. The 3A 10BC that I showed you earlier is about $40 at Ace Hardware. Where to buy or service, again, hardware stores sell the extinguishers, servicing them. Uh, there are several in the yellow pages that will do that, but again, it's not cost effective. Cooking hazards. Well, I was um, deep frying uh, chicken tonight and I had, uh, I did not leave the pan unattended, but if things go wrong, don't panic. Turn off the heat if it is safe to do and never use water on an oil or grease fire. The, the expansion of the, uh, the steam will blow the fire all over your kitchen. I recommend you use a cookie sheet to smother the flames. The reason being that if you wanna use the lid, you have to reach into the fire. The cookie sheet, you can slide over the top of the pot. Why not use a fire extinguisher? Because the force of the discharge can blow the flames onto your cabinets and now you have a kitchen fire. Smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. Again, it's the smoke that, that kills people, not the flames in most cases. So have a smoke detector in every bedroom and in hallways on each floor. Installing a carbon monoxide detector is now a state law as of July 1st, 2011, when you sell your home, but I recommend that you have one anyway, especially if you have uh, gas, uh, natural gas burning appliances like a stove, a water heater, even your heater, because carbon monoxide results from the incomplete burning of the gas in most cases, or even propane. I would test batteries for natural gas and carbon detectors every month. The reason is if you go away for a couple of weeks, that might have died and you won't know it when you come home. I would change detector batteries every 12 months. We've done testing and actually they will last a lot longer than that, but to be safe, do it once a year. I would recommend doing it on New Year's Eve. Reduce fire hazards. This is Jim Bonato's gar uh, uh, garage. I've been there. Uh, at any rate, don't be a pack rat. Don't save things if you don't need to because stuff is fuel for fire. Avoid the electrical octopus, this is ridiculous. When you do that, you realize that you're putting all of these appliances on one electrical circuit and most uh, household electrical circuits are either 15 amp or 20 amp. And just think if you plug all of these things and they're all operating at the same time, how many amps you're pulling it? Look, that one isn't even plugged in all the way. If you're going to use a power strip, do one with a surge protector. That way, if you have a lightning strike nearby or power goes out and comes back on, it will protect your equipment. I recommend at least 2,400 joules. That's a measure of electricity. Uh, definitely don't do one that's uh, less than a thousand. This is a power strip. This is not a surge protector. It doesn't have a circuit breaker. This one does. Here's the uh, fell asleep and the heater caused the fire. Here's the heater too close to the bed material. An undersized, it's called a zip cord that ungrounded two wire cord, very lightweight, not worth much. The other thing uh, to be aware of is never put an electrical cord under a rug because doing so will increase the heat and the, uh, uh, the heat will eventually cause the cord to catch fire. Know where your utilities are located. Most everybody in Pleasant Hill probably now has circuit breakers, but when I bought my house here in 1974, it still had fuses. Um, they've all been replaced, but make certain you know where the main breaker handle is because it shuts off all of the branch circuits. This is your natural gas supply. And of course, this is your water supply. There are automatic shutoff valves for gas are required if you do any major remodeling. Uh, there are two types, excess flow and quake triggered. triggered. 
approximately magnitude 5.5. They can be installed by a licensed plumber. That's about $400. Uh, following an earthquake, if you smell gas or hear it escaping, or if you see the lowest reading dial moving, shut off the meter at the quarter, turn stop cock as shown. We've taught that in the classes. But the stop cock should go off, should go from being in line with the pipe to being across the pipe to shut the gas off. Jim, I'm going to have to take a quick break. I'll be right back. I hope it's not to put out a fire. <laughs> I think you can stop recording and then restart. Good point, but I think that would, he would have to be the one to do it. Yeah. Mark, how you doing? Uh, I'm doing all right. Um, I want to thank you guys again for setting up this refresher. It's certainly been a long time for me since I last had a refresher. It has been, yeah. Maybe about 10 years. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> to be honest, I've lost track. <laughs> okay, I'm back, Jim. Okay, take it I'm away. Worse my, I'm worse than my five-year-old grandson. <laughs> <laughs> okay, plan and practice at least two fire escape routes from your home. One might be the front yard, one in the backyard, one through the garage. But once you're out, stay out. The fire department, when they arrive, will uh, assume the command of the situation. If you're in a, a room and think that there might be fire on the other side, other side, feel the door with the back of your hand. Don't touch the doorknob because if there is fire on the other side, you'll be burned. What do you do if you're on the second floor and there's a fire and you can't use the stairs to get out? I have a second floor in my home. What you can do is obviously, number one, stay calm, stay where you are, close the door, put towels, and by the way, dry towels at the bottom of the door. If you put a wet towel near fire, you're going to get steam and that could end up burning you. Open a window, and the reason for that is you're going to put a sheet or a towel out the window that tells the fire department that's where you are because when they do their size up, they immediately look at the entire structure. Stay low because smoke rises with heat to the ceiling. Hazardous materials, we're very cognizant of this insert because it, it signals an area we do not want to enter. If there's a placard on the building, it will have a series four different colors and they indicate different things. Uh, red obviously is flammable uh, and the number indicates how severe the hazard is. Here's a typical building. Okay, we as CERT would not enter this building uh, because we would have no means of uh, protecting ourselves against whatever is in it. Here's a, a placard that has no fire or other hazard except it's got an oxidizer. Well, oxidizers can create fire just from being in the presence of a combustible, such as oil. Hazardous materials, be upwind and uphill from spills and smoke. We have several refineries in Contra Costa County, not very far from here. Uh, if there is an incident, use the rule of thumb. If you can cover the entire incident with your outstretched arm and your thumb, then you're far enough away. If you can't, you're too close wildfires. And, and as you know, we've got red flag warnings coming up this next week because we've got wind starting tomorrow. There is possibly going to be rain on Sunday, but with humidity uh, being low, fuel moisture, which is right now very low, wind speed and direction, we've had wind today and it'll be even more tomorrow. If you're on a slope, wind blows uh, the fire uphill in narrow canyons, which give you no means of escape on ridges and depending on the time of day. Effect of slope on fire spread. 
if it's a gentle slope, there's no increase. But if it's a up to a 30% slope, it'll it will spread at twice the normal rate. And on a higher slope, it will go even higher on a more steep slope. Defensible space, 30 to 100 feet, if you're on flat ground, should give you dispensable space. If you're on a slope, 200 feet is more required. Clear all combustible debris between the structure and the brush or trees and mow dry grass. There was a news article yesterday on the phone or on the television where an elderly woman was about to lose her fire insurance because they had not cleared all of the brush near her home and a group of neighbors did it. When you build, use fire resistant uh, roofing, the U underwriters laboratories rates combustibility of roofs, A, B, and C. An A, A class roof is the most resistant to burning brands. Um, put a spark arrestor on your chimney if you burn wood. Uh, clean your gutters because dry leaves in the gutter can easily be um, ignited by a nearby exposure. Make sure you have a house number visible from the street so the fire department knows where to come. Clear debris away from the home and clear all debris under decks because the fire again can ignite the debris before it ignites the wood. Do not drive on or park on dry grass uh, because we all drive cars with catalytic converters and they get very hot and they easily spark fires. And in your neighborhood, keep a minimum of 10 foot clear for fire engine ambulance access. It takes 10 feet to get between cars. And if your neighbors park uh, across from each other on a, on a street like mine, a cul-de-sac, an engine or an ambulance can't get through. Remind people to stagger their, spark, their parking so uh, emergency apparatus can get through. And as far as power line clearances to trees, uh, if, it, if you're in a neighborhood that belongs to, uh, the power belongs to PG&E, you can call their number and advise them that there are trees that are within the 12 foot clearance of the power lines. And as you see, it, this is 12 foot from this end and 12 foot from that end. It's important to have it trimmed and removed. Uh, most of those PG&E will handle without cost to the homeowner, but it's best to be aware of them. So that's the fire safety refresher course. Do we have any questions, Jim? I have a question. Um, you said that it's good to replace the fire extinguishers roughly every 12 years. Um, these are pressurized, so they're potentially hazardous. Where do we take them so that they can be safely discharged and perhaps even have uh, some of the uh, container or contents recycled? Um, there is a uh, hazardous material recycling uh, center out on Imhoff, which is out where the, uh, the near Highway 4, and they will accept uh, extinguishers for disposal. Uh, you could also take them to the local fire department, your local station, and ask them to dispose of them. Um, uh, they, the material within them is not hazardous material. Uh, it is under pressure. I think the, the important thing to remember is don't just throw it in the trash can. Um, although when I asked the folks out at the hazmat disposal place about um, uh, smoke detectors, which do contain a small radioactive source, uh, they said they didn't think it was a problem, just throw it in the garbage but uh, I think I'd take it and have them do it. Any other questions? No questions? Um, Don, you have a question on chat. Um, how do people clean under a low deck? That's a good question because most of them are nailed down. Uh, other than using a leaf blower and trying to blow it out an opening on an open side, you really can't do much. But if it's that closed, you probably not are, aren't collecting much under it. Okay. 
Anyone else? If you have a um, gas grill, um, where do you where do you and you have more than one gas tank? Where, where do you put those extra gas tanks? You put them outside your home, certainly not in the garage, correct? Right. Uh, I would recommend outside, away from any openings, uh, because if it does leak, you don't want the gas coming into the house because it then could ignite. Um, Typically, if you just keep it 10 feet away from an ignition source, you're fine. The only thing I would be aware of is if you're putting it in the defensible space, when the fire occurs, it's going to blow that, uh, that gas tank open. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? What do you think, Jim? Actually, garages. You know, garages tends to oh. be... Um, there's a lot of things over there. So, so what do you recommend? Put move the things from the garage to like paid storage, or I mean, how much, how many thing, how much can you put in a garage before it becomes uh, a fire hazard? Well, the building code and the fire code say five gallons, but that's still a lot of material. Uh, if you're going to keep gasoline in the garage, I recommend you put it in a safety can which we didn't touch on, but you can buy safety cans, UL listed safety cans at Ace Hardware as well. Uh, they are guaranteed not to rend during exposure to a fire. They have a spark arrester to prevent uh, a, a, an ignition from actually getting into the tank itself. Uh, they probably cost about 50 bucks a piece, but if you're going to store gas inside, of course your car is full of gas, but your car also has a, a sealed gas tank. Um, I would recommend you get a safety can if you're going to do that. And again, five gallons is the limit and that's the aggregate limit of flammable liquids within a home. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Hey Don, I've noticed on a fire extinguisher, there's, there's an overcharged portion of the meter or the gauge. Right. What causes that? I've just been curious about that. Well, uh, most of them are, are uh, pressurized to 300 PSI, but it could have been the, the person filling the extinguisher was overzealous. Huh. Uh, it's like those extinguishers we use for training. They're just water with pressurized air. Uh, you can overpressure them. And of course, then there's the possibility they could uh, rend open and injure you. Okay. Uh, if if you've got an extinguisher that's over or that's over pressurized, I would take it to one of the extinguisher servicing companies and have them bleed it back to normal. Ah, uh, okay. Anyone else? Well, I thank you for your attention. If you do come up with other questions, you can email them to me. I think most of you have my email address. It's my name, Don Mayo, FPC at AOL.com. And I'll be glad to answer your questions. All right. Well, thank you very much, Don, for your presentation. That was good. And uh, it was, it, it was, you know, very, very helpful in, in uh, refreshing my mind on things that I, I need to do around the house, especially in the garage. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you for reminding me about that. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> there was one more question in the chat window. Uh, somebody asked, is mulch a fire hazard? Um, mulch, which gets dry, wood burn if you have a nearby uh, wildfire. Um, course the problem is what do you do with it I guess you could say keep it watered um, but we don't normally tend to water our mulch it's there to cover the ground uh, it is combustible um, so I guess use your judgment as to whether or not you want to keep it close to your home yeah you could spread it out uh, which would make it uh, while it's still combustible it would make the fire load less and the spreading of the flames would be uh, would be uh, inhibited somewhat. Also, if you kept the uh, the mulch level very low. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
All right, Don, thanks again. Oh, looks like Molly has a question. All right, keep them coming. You're muted, Molly. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is very good. A good refresher. Thank you. I got to look at my old fire extinguishers, like, you know, 10 years old. Ah! Well, <laughs> it, to be quite well, honest, if, if the gauge is still green, and it hasn't been subjected to a, a moisture so that it's got corrosion on it, it's probably just as safe. I and hope it probably so. probably will work just the same. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you, Don. Needed a refresher. You're Thank welcome, you, Don. Man. Very nicely done. <laughs> All right, Don. So if you want to hit the uh, record button again, it, it should probably stop the recording. Where do I find it? Uh, uh, hover your mouse in the near the bottom of the screen. Oh. Yep. All right.